Welcome back to Rockford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, and we are currently on Chapter 8, entitled of, excuse me, excuse me, entitled of The Quest of the Golden Fleece. We're going to finish this chapter up in this episode, end the episode, and then we'll start back on the next chapter with a brand new episode. Excuse me. Okay. In Daltry County, Georgia, one can see easily the results of this experiment in huddling for protection. Only 10% of the adult population was born in the county, and yet the blacks outnumber the whites four or five to one. There is undoubtedly a security to the blacks in their very numbers, a personal freedom from arbitrary treatment, which makes hundreds of laborers cling to Daltry in spite of low wages and economic distress. But a change is coming. And slowly but surely, even here, the agricultural laborers are drifting to town and leaving the broad acres behind. Why is this? Why do not the Negroes become landowners and build up the black-landed peasantry, which has for a generation and more been the dream of philanthropists and statesmen? To the car window sociologist, to the man who seeks to understand and know the South by devoting the few leisure hours of a holiday trip to unraveling the snarl of centuries, to such men, very often the whole trouble with the black field hand may be summed up by Aunt Ophelia's word, quote, shiftless, end quote. They have noted repeatedly scenes like one I saw last summer. We were riding along the high road to town at the close of a long hot day. A couple of young black fellows passed us in a mule team with several bushels of loose corn in the ear. One was driving, listlessly bent forward, his elbows on his knees, a happy-go-lucky, careless picture of irresponsibility. The other was fast asleep in the bottom of the wagon. As we passed, we noticed an ear of corn fall from the wagon. They never saw it, not they. Arrived farther on, we noted another ear on the ground. And between that creeping mule and town, we counted 26 ears of corn. Shiftless? Yes, the personification of shiftlessness. And yet follow those boys. They are not lazy. Tomorrow morning, they'll be up with the sun. They work hard when they do work, and they work willingly. They had no sordid, selfish, money-getting ways, but rather a fine disdain for mere cash. They'll loaf before your face and work behind your back with good-natured honesty. They'll steal a watermelon, they'll steal a watermelon and hand you back your lost purse intact. Their great defect as laborers lies in their lack of incentive to work beyond the mere pleasure of physical exertion. They are careless because they have not found that it pays to be careful. They are improvident because the improvident ones of their acquaintance get on about as well as the provident. Above all, they cannot see why they should take unusual pains to make the white man's land better or to fatten his mule or save his corn. On the other hand, the white landowner argues that any attempt to improve these laborers by increased responsibility or higher wages or better homes or land of their own, would be sure to result in failure. He shows his northern visitor the scarred and wretched land, the ruined mansions, the worn-out soil and mortgaged acres, and says, this is Negro freedom. Now what happens that both master and man have just enough argument on their respective sides to make it difficult for them to understand each other. The Negro dimly personifies in the white man all his ills and misfortunes, if he is poor, it is because the white man seizes the fruit of his toil. If he is ignorant, it is because the white man gives him neither time nor facilities to learn. And indeed, if any misfortune happens to him, it is because of some hidden machinations of, quote, white folks, end quote. On the other hand, the masters and the masters' sons have never been able to see why the Negro, instead of settling down to be day laborers for bread and clothes, are infected with the silly desire to rise in the world and why they are sulky, dissatisfied, and careless, where their fathers were happy and dumb and faithful. Quote, why, you niggers have an easier time than I do, end quote, said a puzzled Albany merchant to his black customer. Quote, yes, end quote, he replied. Quote, and so does your hogs, end quote. So uh, I want to reflect there. The 
to me, Du Bois does just does a perfect job of of diagnosing what the of diagnosing the disease of freedom and the disease or the disease of emancipation, what the disease of emancipation meant. Cause it's not necessarily freedom. I think freedom is the wrong word to be using. Yeah. Even though of course they're using the word freedom and you know, the Freedmen's Bureau and, and Du Bois is using the word freedmen and freedom a few times. But I think the more appropriate word is emancipation because these people have been emancipated, but they still lied in a no man's land that was in between emancipation and freedom. And cause, because they, they weren't really free. They couldn't go anywhere that they wanted. They couldn't say whatever they wanted. They couldn't work wherever they wanted. They, they weren't, they were being exploited at every turn, discriminated against at every turn. They were being killed simply for existing. Uh, and so they weren't being allowed to learn they, they, or they didn't have the opportunity or the avenues to learn. So they, they essentially stopped being physically enslaved in the form of chattel slavery, but they were not given the access to the freedom that existed in the country. And that encapsulates the whole entire experience of black people in mass in this country is they have, we have continued to exist in this area that's in between emancipation and freedom. And there have uh, constantly been structural and institutional barriers set up that limited in one way or another the advancement of black people to get to this freedom. And it looks different at different points in time based on what the it looks different based on what the time period is, but a lot of the same things that are being pointed out here exist now in a different, just in a different manner. Taking then the dissatisfied and shiftless field hand as a starting point, let us inquire how the black thousands of Dowtry have struggled from him up toward their ideal and what their ideal is. All social struggle is evidenced by the rise first of economic, then of social classes, among a homogeneous population. Today, the following economic classes are plainly differentiated among these Negroes. A, quote, submerged tenth, end quote, of croppers with a few paupers. 40% who are meter, 40% who are metters, and 39% of semi-metters and wage laborers. There are left 5% of money renters and 6% of freeholders, the, quote, upper 10, end quote, of the land. The croppers are entirely without capital, even in the limited sense of food or money to keep them from seed time to harvest. All they furnish is their labor. The landowner furnishes land, stock, tools, seed, and house. And at the end of the year, the laborer gets from a third to a half of the crop. Out of his share, however, comes pay and interest for food and clothing advanced him during the year. Thus, we have a laborer without capital and without wages and an employer whose capital was largely his employees' wages. It is, an it is an unsatisfactory arrangement, both for hirer and hired, and is usually in vogue on poor land with hard-pressed owners. Above the croppers come the great mass of the black population who work the land on their own responsibility, paying rent in cotton and supported by the crop mortgage system. After the war, this system was attractive to the free men on account of its larger freedom and its possibilities for making a surplus. But with the carrying out of the crop lying system, the deterioration of the land and the slavery of debt, the position of the metayers has sunk to a dead level of practical of practically unrewarded toil. Formerly, all tenants had some capital and often considerable, but absentee landlordism, rising rack rent, and falling cotton have stripped them well nigh of all, and probably not over half of them today own their mules. The change from cropper to tenant was accomplished by fixing the rent. If, now, the rent fixed was reasonable, this was an incentive to the tenant to strive. On the other hand, if the rent was too high, or if the land deteriorated, 
the result was to discourage and check the efforts of the black peasantry. There is no doubt that the latter case is true. That in Dowtree County, every economic advantage of the price of cotton in market and of the strivings of the tenant has been taken advantage of by the landlords and merchants and swallowed up in rent and interest. If cotton rose in price, the rent rose even higher. If cotton fell, the rent remained or followed reluctantly. If a tenant worked hard and raised a large crop, his rent was raised the next year. If that year the crop failed, his corn was confiscated and his mule sold for debt. There were, of course, exceptions to this, cases of personal kindness and forbearance. But in the vast majority of cases, the rule was to extract the uttermost farthing from the mass of the black farm laborers. The average Mateyer pays from 20 to 30 percent of his crop in rent. The result of such rack rent can only be evil, abuse and neglect of the soil, deterioration in the character of the labor, and a widespread sense of injustice. Quote, wherever the country is poor, end quote, cried Arthur Young, quote, it is in the hands of Mateyers, end quote, and, quote, their condition is more wretched than that of day laborers, end quote. He was talking of Italy a century ago, but he might have been talking of Dowtree County today. And especially is that true today, which he declares was true in France before the revolution. Quote, the Mateyers are considered as little better than menial servants, removable at pleasure, and obliged to conform in all things to the will of the landlords, end quote. On this low plain, half the black population of Dowtree County, perhaps more than half the black millions of this land, are today struggling. Okay, I'm going to look up the definition of a Mateyer. I mean, that, that word hadn't been used, uh, so give me one second. Okay, so the definition that I have for Meteor is, or meteor, is one that cultivates land for a share of its yield, usually receiving stock, tools, and seed from the landlord. So essentially just another word for sharecropping. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to just keep reading and we might get to a point here. We have a reflection shortly. Uh. Okay. A degree above these, we may place those laborers who receive money wages for their work. Some receive a house with perhaps a garden spot, the supplies of food and clothing are advanced, and certain fixed wages are given at the end of the year, varying from thirty to sixty dollars, out of which the supplies must be paid for with interest. About eighteen percent of the population belong to this class of semi-metayers while 22% are laborers paid by the month or year and are either, quote, furnished, end quote, by their own savings or perhaps more usually by some merchant who takes his chances of payment. Such laborers receive from 35 to 50 cents a day during the working season. They are usually young, unmarried persons, some being women. And when they marry, they sink to the class of the Mateyers or, more seldom, become renters. The renters for fixed money rentals are the first of the emerging class and form 5% of the families. The sole advantage of this small class is their freedom to choose their crops and the increased responsibility which comes through having money transactions. While some of the renters differ little in condition from the Mateyers, yet on the whole they are more intelligent and responsible persons and are the ones who eventually become landowners. Their better character and greater shrewdness enable them to gain perhaps to demand, better terms and rents, rented farms varying from 40 to 100 acres, bear an average rental of about $54 a year. The men who conduct such farms do not long remain renters. Either they sink to Mateyers or with the successful series of harvests rise to the landowners. In 1870, the tax books of Dowtree report no Negroes as landholders. If there were any such at that time, and there may have been a few, their land was probably held in the name of some white patron, a method not uncommon during slavery. In 1875, ownership of land had begun with 750 acres. Ten years later, this land had increased to over 6,500 acres, to 9,000 acres in 1890, and 10,000 in 1900. 
The total assessed property has in this same period risen from $80,000 in 1875 to $240,000 in the 1900. Two circumstances complicate this development and make it in some respects difficult to be sure of the real tendencies. They are the Panic of 1893 and the low price of cotton in 1898. Besides this, the system of assessing property in the country districts of Georgia is somewhat antiquated and of uncertain statistical value. There are no assessors, and each man makes a sworn return to a tax receiver. Thus, public opinion plays a large part and returns very strangely from year to year. Certainly, these figures show the small amount of accumulated capital among the Negroes and the consequently large dependence of their property on temporary prosperity. They have little to tide over a few years of economic depression and are at the mercy of the cotton market far more than the whites. And thus the landowners, despite their marvelous efforts, are really a transient class, continuing to be depleted by those who fall back into the class of renters or materials, and augmented by newcomers from the masses. Of the 100 landowners in 1898, half have bought their land since 1893, a fourth between 1890 and 1893, a fifth between 1884 and 1890, and the rest between 1870 and 1884. In all, 185 Negroes have owned land in the, count in the county since 1875. If all the black landowners who had ever held land here had kept it or left it in the hands of black men, the Negroes would have owned nearer 30,000 acres than the 15,000 they now hold. And yet these 15,000 acres are a creditable showing, a proof of no little weight of the worth and ability of the Negro people. If they had been given an economic start at emancipation, if they had been in an enlightened and rich community which really desired their best good, then we might perhaps call such a result small or even insignificant. But for a few thousand poor, ignorant field hands, in the face of poverty, a falling market, and social stress, to save and capitalize $200,000 in a generation has meant a tremendous effort. The rise of a nation, the pressing forward of a social class, means a bitter struggle, a hard and soul-sickening battle with the world such as few of the more favored classes know or appreciate. Out of the hard economic conditions of this portion of the Black Belt, only 6% of the population have succeeded in emerging into peasant proprietorship, and these are not all firmly fixed but grow and shrink in number with the wavering of the cotton market. Fully 94% have struggled for land and failed, and half of them sit in hopeless serfdom. For these, there is one other avenue of escape toward which they have turned in increasing numbers, namely, migration to town. A glance at the distribution of land among the black owners curiously reveals this fact. In 1898, the holdings were as follows. Under 40 acres, 49 excuse me, under 40 acres, 49 families, 40 to 250 acres, 17 families, 250 to 1,000 acres, 13 families, 1,000 or more acres, two families. Now in 1890, there were 44 holdings, but only nine of these were under 40 acres. The great increase of holdings then has come in the buying of small homesteads near town where their owners rarely where their owners really share in the town life. This is a part of the rush to town. And for every landowner who has thus hurried away from the narrow and hard conditions of country life, how many field hands, how many tenants, how many ruined renters have joined that long procession? Is it not strange compensation? The sin of the country districts is visited on the town, and the social sores of city life today may, here in Dowtry County, and perhaps in many places near and far, look for their final healing without the city walls. And that brings us to the end of chapter eight, entitled Of the Quest of the Golden Fleece, and brings us to the beginning of chapter nine, which is entitled Of the Sons of Master and Man. We will begin that chapter on the next episode, and we will have a small reflection at the end of this episode, and we'll wrap it up. Okay, so... I think in reflection, this chapter really did a great job of illustrating what the working conditions were like 
for the sharecroppers and the meteors. I don't know if it's meteors or meteors or, but the people who essentially who were partaking in the, some form of system of sharecropping. I also watched a, I also watched the, I've been watching documentaries or little, these small little, like, I think I remember what they're called, but they're like little small animated documentaries where they talk about crash course, black, black American history crash course. And they talked about sharecropping and the experience of sharecropping on there as well. And I just think this, this, this specific chapter did a great job of illustrating the experience of the laborers and the experience and what the labor was like and the experience of what the living conditions was like and how connected the living conditions were with the working conditions. And the previous chapter sort of gave you an illustration of what the black belt, what the view of it was like, what it looked like, like sort of almost like a, like you were sort of getting a, a picture of just the, the visual, I guess it's like a very sur surface level visual description of the black belt. And I felt like this went into a deep dive into the experience of the labor of the people in the black belt. And I feel like, you know, each chapter has sort of had a specific overall theme. And so to me, this, this chapter does a great job of explaining to you what these working conditions were like, how connected they were to the living conditions, how connected the working conditions were to racism, the type of exploitation that came out of these working conditions. And I think that when you look at the time period this is, and when you, again, when, when one of the things you want to be able to do is to trace back the injustices that exist now to the inceptions of some of these things. And I think this does a great job of tracing back the historical exploitation that black people have had in the labor market in this country. So we will be back tomorrow to begin a new chapter of the souls of black folk. I think we'll probably be done with this book maybe in a week or so. Got about maybe seven to 10 episodes worth of material still in here. Uh, so please share this whatever platform you're listening to it on. Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey in the struggle against police, terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I'm going to holler at you tomorrow.